Well, uh, first let me express my deep gratitude to the organizers of this conference. Um, I also wish to bow to all the venerables and to my distinguished colleagues. Uh, it is an honor to be allowed to speak in this blessed location. My presentation includes four sections. Uh, the introduction suggests one way to envision filiality from the perspective of our entanglement in samsara. The second section provides a sample of pre-Buddhist and Buddhist text and their various blends of filial piety. The third section more specifically discusses what I called the Zen twist of Tore, a Japanese teacher of the Rinzai school who lived in the 18th century. <coughs> the last section deals with universalist and particularist appropriations of filial piety, a set of reflections leading to, to the conclusion. Well, there are a few issues at stake with, uh, which I try to, to summarize um, in the following slide. The first thing is that we need to revisit an old problem um, which is linked to um, how ideas move across borders. And the second thing is that the Chinese concept of xiao, which is usually translated as filial piety, um, is something that could be considered from several perspectives. And one of them uh, is to say, well, this is a widespread phenomenon that can be witnessed everywhere. And the other would be to say uh, that we need to distinguish it from the various forms of what we could call devotion towards one's parents. And the third problem is the Buddhist reinterpretation of it, this particular concept um, and its wider significance. So in any case, um, let me just um, say something more personal first. Um, on a personal note and in the inter interest of full disclosure, I should mention that I have two sons. Uh, although they were born in Japan, uh, none of them seems inclined towards filial piety, <laughs> uh, especially the older one. Uh, he's a 15-year-old rebellious teenager who often um, indulges in cursing his father to understand the meaning of the expression filial piety. <laughs> in any case, um, let us first, um, sorry, I'm too early. Um, let us first envision the broader picture. Um, not many certainties are shared by all human beings regardless of their personal, cultural, and religious backgrounds. Among them figures the inevitability of death which also implies its correlate, the undeniable reality of birth. Uh, because of their emphasis on impermanence, Asian religions and Buddhist traditions in particular have always accentuated the bond between life and death. Such perspective is uh, reflected in technical term samsara, often translated as life-death, so deeply intertwined that a hyphen needs to link both terms. The Chinese translation of the same concept, sheng si, also suggests that life and death are akin to the two sides of the same coin. As soon as one explores the awareness that death occurs as the natural consequence of birth, it leads to questioning the philosophical and moral implications of having received life from two human beings we usually call our parents. In also historic contexts in which the concept of filial piety was reinterpreted in significantly different ways. Our understanding of this concept needs to be complicated accordingly. This leads us to a general reflection about the present relevance or obsolescence of filial piety in the globalizing world. For this, we need to consider how formulations of filial piety can either be bent in the direction of an old encompassing universalist concept or, in the contrary, be appropriated as an instrument to justify particularism and enforce submissive behaviors. The theme of filial piety, or xiao, uh, which has also been recently translated as family reverence, uh, was emphasized in China long before the introduction of Buddhism. On the other hand, we know that filial devotion was not a uniquely Chinese phenomenon. 
Remaining inscriptions in South Asia tell us that donors often, often made a gift dedicated to their parents living or dead. For instance, sometimes the dedication is explained by the donor as, quote unquote, an act of puja for my mother and father and for the advantage and happiness of all beings. The most surprising feature of these inscriptions is not only that the, their stated purpose was the worship of the donor's parents and their well-being, but also that, uh, quote unquote, this concern for the well-being of deceased and living parents was an active concern and major preoccupation of Indian Buddhist monks in particular. Uh, this is uh, Gregory Chopin's uh, words. And his discoveries contribute to put into perspective conventional um, geographical divides and to problem problematize the usual distinction between clergy and lay followers. So just a, a little interlude here uh, about the, the dilemma that we tend to face, about whether uh, we should just leave at this and um, assume that things uh, are as they appear to be. And in that regard, I should perhaps mention the fact that uh, the theme of welfare is only remotely uh, related to my paper. Um, well, depending on whether the emphasis is put on the concept or on the practices that are performed independently from the various labels attached to them, uh, one needs to fine tune the analysis and not to take for granted the prevalence of a universal set of attitudes towards one's parents. So I suggest that the widespread distribution of practices associated with family reverence indicates the, co the coexistence of two distinct phenomena. First, a generic form of filial worship resulting from the perception of the import importance of receiving life and the indebtedness associated with it, which knows no particular geographical boundaries and appears especially ubiquitous in Asia. And second, the specifically Sinaitic interpretation of this perception, which took a life of its own and spread across East Asia in particular. For the purpose of this paper, I shall mostly focus on the Sino-Japanese developments before returning to wider issues. The filial piety implied a deep link between the personal sphere of family relations, the public sphere of government, and its consequences for the achievement of social fame and success. It is no, thus no surprise that this concept served as one of the central pillars of the Confucian ideology. Its implication was that citizens either would comply with it or rebel against it, uh, the latter case implying social exclusion. Well, Philippi is a pretty heavy topic. Uh, most of us may feel some degree of guilt because we cannot or could not take proper care of our parents. Fortunately, here um, there is an alternative to simply seeing this as an unavoidable duty toward one's relatives. Some Buddhist traditions suggest a much wider understanding of what this concept entails, specific, uh, especially of who are the beneficiaries. Such reinterpretation is called great filial piety and provides, provides a way to universalize the idea. This constitutes the crucial juncture where I see a movement from the particularist interpretation of filial piety to a universalist take. As we saw in China by the third century of the common era, filial piety had become both an uh, unavoidable form of social behavior and a rather lifeless idea because it implied conformity with the established social norms. It is in this context that we witness the emergence of several Buddhist scriptures touching the same theme while claiming to put new wine in old bottles. I suggest to focus on one particular piece, the sutra on the difficulty of reciprocating the kindness of parents. Its translation is attributed to An Shu Gao, uh, who reached Luoyang in 148, but this attribution is suspicious. According to recent research, uh, only about 13 of An Shu Gao's works can be regarded as genuine. Another indication in this regard is provided by Seng Yu, 
in his catalog of work, works, included in the Tripitaka, who wrote that, quote unquote, it was copied from the, the middle length discourses. Actually, the source that seems to have inspired the sutra on the difficulty of reciprocating the kindness of parents is rather found in the Chinese translation of the Ekotagarama Sutra, which contains the main ingredients of the narrative. This translation was completed in 397. If we admit that this constitutes the main source for the narrative found in the Sutra on the difficulty of reciprocating the kindness of parents, it pushes the date of its composition to after the end of the fourth century. Uh, let me briefly mention its close equivalent in the Pali Canon. So in the Pali Canon, uh, this piece is included in the Anguttara Nikaya, or numerical discourses. I'll skip the, the reading of this text, but it car carries a very simple message. First, it emphasizes the child's indebtedness and the impossibility to reciprocate this through material means. Secondly, it prescribes to use the only means of true reciprocation, which is to convey four of the essential tenets of Buddhism. Considerable work remains to be done to establish the precise chronology of the early Buddhist sources as well as of their translations or reiterations. And I will leave the mapping of this research area to specialists. Let us now fast forward more than 1,200 years to examine a commentary on this sutra composed in 18th century Japan. The annotated commentary on the sutra on the difficulty of reciprocating the kindness of parents by Tore Enji sheds a different light on the text discussed so far. Tore also wrote another work focusing on the theme of filial piety, which is called The Oral Explanation of the Filial Piety Classics in the Three Teachings of Shinto, Confucianism, and Buddhism. This indicates Tore's lifelong interest in an early form of comparative studies stemming in part from his personal commitment to practice a dying form of Shinto while assuming the abbacy of a major Rinzai monastery. Tore's annotated commentary was composed in July 1770 when Tore was 50 years old according to the traditional reckoning. These lectures coincided with a memo memorial service for his own parents. In his annotated commentary, Tore reviews and compares three main sources and describes how each of them borrowed from the pre previously existing scripture. Uh, he begins with the sutra on the difficulty of reciprocating the kindness of parents, saying that it can be considered the primary source. And then secondly, he mentions the sutra of the filial child. <coughs> uh, before moving to the comment, if for those of you who have a handout, I think there are a few that are left in the back of the room perhaps. Um, if especially uh, people who can read Chinese could use them, I think it may be beneficial because I've tried to, to map a little bit the, the, um, the transmission of uh, this narrative. So you can, you can just look at this chart. Uh, it's going to be a little messy on the screen, I'm afraid. Mm, okay, uh, so let, us, let me just um, um, return to it later and um, see how Tori um, describes the second source that he examines called the Sutra of the Philal Child. Um, and about the Sutra of the Philal Child, um, he said that, quote, um, its essential message is lacking and it has lost the deep meaning of the Sutra, end quote. The third source is the Sutra on the depth of the parent's kindness, which Tori considered to be an apocryphal Sutra. Well, Tori's knowledge of the scriptures was amazing in many ways, but he did not even consider questioning the claim that the first sutra had been authored or translated by An uh, This shows the limits of his scholarship. Aside from this issue of authorship or translation, uh, the originality of Tori's analysis is that he considered the older and more concise sutra on the difficulty of reciprocating the kindness of parents as not only the most reliable, but also as the most profound source. He viewed subsequent scriptures as merely popular adaptations. This begs the question of what Tore considered to be the essential message of the sutra. Uh, the answer is linked to the actual scripture, which I have retranslated for the sake of this paper, but um, to spare time, 
I will ask you to read at your leisure for those of you who have the, the handout. And I would be very grateful if you could provide feedback. So what is the essential message of the sutra according to Tori? Um, and for this, we, we need to examine how Tori extracted the core meaning of the scripture, which otherwise could easily be read as commonplace. He dissected the sutra into three main sections, focusing in particular on its symbolic meaning, which he describes thus in his annotated commentary. Um, he writes, quote, the sutra considers the wisdom and the excellence of the Tathagata as the father and the compassionate vows of the Bodhisattva as the mother. They the sutra right of wisdom as the mother. This indicates the direct cause. The sutra considers the skillful means of practice as the father and the perfection of wisdom realized through the actualization of one's true nature as the mother, thus progressing and reaching the supreme stage of perfection. This indicates the concluding cause." End quote. So what this commentary suggests um, is how this sutra can be understood from a philosophical perspective rather than as a moral tale. Yet it only reflects Torrey's application of scholastic categories and it's not especially Zen-like. His commentary on section six in the translation of the sutra introduces an altogether different perspective. He analyzes um, each of the words in the apparently trivial passage saying, when the Dharma is realized, morality is realized. Samadhi, wisdom, liberation, and liberated insight are realized. And he provides the following comment concerning the last clause. Quote, the single eye on one's forehead cuts off the wisdom eye and surpasses the Dharma eye. Without penetrating the tiny matter of going beyond, according to the Zen approach, how could one obtain this small share? End quote. So according to Tori, the various types of insight gained by accomplished practitioners who follow traditional Buddhism are still limited and need to be surpassed by the subtler awakened perception gained through the practice of going beyond. He considers that this advanced phase of practice requires overcoming attachment to the initial realization of one's true nature until all traces of the initial breakthrough have disappeared. This is where Torre gives a different twist to the narrative of the sutra and extrapolates from the sim simple idea of reciprocating the kindness of one's parents through filial behavior to the idea of reciprocating the kindness of all sentient beings by leading them to the ultimate stage of realization. After having examined the main features of Torre's annotated commentary, we can now widen our discussion and consider how filial piety was either interpreted from the perspective of its application to one's blood relatives or envisioned as including all sentient beings among its beneficiaries. This particular point, I, I believe, may serve to establish a link with the present significance of this concept in an increasingly globalized world. Obviously, Torre was not the only cleric to have reformulated the concept of filial piety to allow for a broader interpretation. He was in particular inspired by the work of forger Chu Song, who had attempted to demonstrate how Buddhist teachings converged to a large extent with Confucianism and Taoism, but nevertheless provide a deeper interpretation of great filial piety. The last section of Forger's work includes an extended discourse on filial piety. Forger explains that his discourse aims at, quote unquote, expounding the profound rationale and hidden intentions of our sages. In his oral explanation of fil the filial piety classics in the three teachings of Shinto, Confucianism, and Buddhism, Torre repeatedly quotes Forger to emphasize the universality of filial piety. Forger and Torre both wanted to convey to their respective audiences the central idea that all beings could have been our relatives in previous lives or may become so in, future exist in a future existence, and that great filial piety thus needs to be understood as including all sentient beings. In his annotated commentary, Torre legitimates this interpretation by quoting the sutra of the great skillful means 
of the Buddha to reciprocate his parents' kindness. Let me briefly read this quote. Uh, because they receive a bodily form, all sentient beings have also been the mothers and fathers of the Tathagata. For the sake of all sentient beings, the Tathagata has also become their fathers and mothers. Because he becomes the father and mother of everyone, he constantly cultivates the most difficult practices and the hardest austerities. He is expert in renouncing what is difficult to renounce. Um, this leads to some um, concluding elements. Uh, the above should suffice to indicate the extent of the shift that occurred between the earlier Confucian sources exclusively stressing respect to one's parents as a gateway to morality, their equivalent in early Buddhist scriptures, and the reinterpretation of the same concept by Forger and Torre. What may have been on the verge of becoming an obsolete idea was infused with new vitality as its implications were expanded from one's own family to the unlimited sphere of all sentient beings. We still need to fine tune some of the details of this evolution, but a general picture of how filial piety was skillfully reformulated in Song China and in 18th century Japan begins to emerge. To what extent this transformation may yield further insight into ways to reach out to those eager to focus on family values remains to be seen. What clearly appears is that particularist interpretations of filial piety limited to one's relatives lack the suggestive power supplied by Torres' twist of the same concept. 